Hello, hello, here we are again, coming to you from Broadcast Team Alpha on 44 different platforms around the world. And uh, my name is Argy, I'm the host tonight, and we are going to have a blast. We're going to talk about all the stuff that we really can't understand when it comes to little creatures and maybe big creatures. And maybe creatures that aren't creatures at all, maybe ghosts or something that have been creatures. And um, we're also transmitting on the wonderful platform of Conscious Awakening Network. Got to go over there and have a look at them because they go to 50 different shows that talks about all of the stuff that we all need to know. So go check it out at uh, the uh, ConsciousAwakeningNetwork.org. And they're on YouTube also with the same name. And uh, for those of you that want to get a hold of me, you can just go to broadcastteamalpha.com, broadcastteamalpha.com, and send us an email. And uh, Nori or I, we will get back to you, and we can see if we can help you out with whatever you might need. And... Um, just as a real quick note at the end before I introduce the guest is that Nori and I created a spiritual think tank. We are doing incredible things. Sometimes it seems like we are creating out of seemingly nothing right out of the quantum field and shows up in the physical with us. If you want to be part of something like that and check it out, send us an email to the mastermind connection at gmail.com and I'll send you some information and a link to come and check it out for yourself to see if you want to be part of this and then I'm going to introduce our guest this is going to be a delight I have known about Linda Eastburn for quite a while I just never contacted her before I uh, Oh, for the last couple of years, I've been wanting to get her on as a guest, and it just never happened. But now she's going to be with us for the next hour. She is uh, an on-air personality, an author. Of her latest book is called Threshold to Encounters. And that is encounters with cryptoids, ghosts, Sasquatch, and maybe other things. And also, she's a filmmaker and an intuitive. She now hosts the Linda Eastburn channel on YouTube. And for the next hour, she's with us. And uh, she is also the, uh, the host of the, she was actually the host of the TV and her radio show, Anomalies. So uh, she's got a, a background that's going to be very interesting and we're going to talk about it. So welcome to the show, Linda. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Uh, you talk about so many things. And uh, where do you think we should start? Maybe I know you've done a lot of shows on the Sasquatch. Or maybe let's let's try that because he is or she is everywhere. What do you think the Sasquatch actually is? Well, I think that's a really, really good question because I interview a lot of people that are far deeper into the research even than I am. So I have a lot of perspective from different sources. Some people think they're um, a type of human even. Uh, because they have so many qualities like the human being, even though they live in the wild um, and they are seen occasionally. But then other people also find they have kind of supernatural abilities. They kind of come in, come out, um, an orb will appear and a flash will happen and there's a Bigfoot, almost like the fairy world. I mean, I've even heard them referred to as, as a fairy. My personal opinion is they definitely have a flesh and blood characteristic to them. I think they they reproduce, they eat, they poop in the woods, you know, all of these things happen. Um, so they have some form of flesh and blood characteristic to them. 
whether they have some paranormal capabilities of coming and going, fairy-like, live in the woods, and maybe are even um, some kind of a life form from the trees. Some of the Native Americans here in the United States believe that they just disappear into a tree. And that could be, I don't know. I've heard of situations where a tree will actually look like it's on fire or will have some kind of an unusual form to it. Um, but then um, a Sasquatch comes out of the tree, poof, there it is, the fire is gone, the tree is not on fire, it's just kind of the energy light from the Sasquatch itself. So what these things are is very, very unusual, I don't know for sure, and of course we only have the anecdotal comments of people who've had those experiences, I haven't seen one myself. I did a film called Byways of Bigfoot where I went out in the woods and we actually did find evidence of Bigfoot. We found foot uh, tracks, we found track ways. Um, we found a lot of structures that looked like they had some quality of possibly a Bigfoot breaking limbs and such real close to where the footprints were um, and a few other things. But Bigfoot I know has been seen there. Sasquatch has been seen in the areas where we found these footprints. Uh, people have seen them. I just haven't seen them myself. Um, they seem to have just a real human-like quality about them, too. When when people see one up close, eye to eye, so to speak, they tend to have the ability to, um, to convey a kind of almost human-like emotion. Um, but a lot of people say they have just this great sense of sadness when they look them in the eye. And I'm not sure what that's about. I'm not sure if um, if maybe they, they might be a remnant kind of... Uh, being a remnant kind of human that just doesn't seem to fall into the norm of like our society, certainly, but they don't seem to also fit maybe in the norm of nature anymore either. Um, maybe because we're infringing upon their territory, taking over their their life home places. Yeah. Um, they don't seem to like that either. They seem to get very upset when trees are torn down and logging happens or a new subdivision comes in in an area where they exist. So I'm not sure exactly what they are. I think the, 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 the jury is still out on that one on a concrete level, but they definitely are some kind of a flesh and blood being that have some kind of potentially have some kind of paranormal qualities about them. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned flesh and blood and that is, uh, there is a picture that I found on the internet from about 1910 or something where there was hunters that was out there and they ran into one and they shot one and they took a picture of it. I don't know if you've seen anything like that, but I'm concerned that is murder, but uh, I don't think they thought of it that way back then. I haven't seen I haven't seen that specifically, but I know there are kind of two camps. One is willing to shoot them, and the other is not. I talk to far more people who are not willing to shoot yeah. them, but they would like to have some kind of a specimen if they could find one that's already deceased or something like that. Um, it's so rare to have any form of an encounter with one that finding one that is is still alive or dead um, is really a task. Um, either way. Um, but yeah. finding one that's dead and then to be able to bring it to some kind of authorities, I've heard of a few people that have um, talked about that, at least in the past, not so much recently. But then the authorities kind of dispose of the body and we never seem to get any information regarding that. So I don't know if it's a if it's a specific cover up that they don't want us to know about it, or if there's, I'm not, I'm not sure why. I mean, I can understand that they don't want to create fear um, in, you know, for people to enjoy nature, but they also, there's a lot of industry out there, logging industry and others that, you know, that would be harmed potentially because yeah. of protecting an area where they might be. But then there's also a thought if they do find that they're related, closely related to the human being, then we're talking, what kind of rights do they have? And, you know, how do we um, classify them? Are, are they human or are they animal? Um, so those are all questions that I think might cause there to be concern. And so a cover up might be underway just for that reason alone. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think you're right. They're, they are fairly close to a human because mm -hmm. they even have a language. Yes, they do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, that's how I got started in this was interviewing Scott Nelson. He um, he was a linguist with the, the U.S. Navy, and he was very good at that. But he accidentally heard um, the Sierra sounds, which was recorded by Ron Moorhead up in the Sierra Mountains back in the 70s. It was a very old, um, very old recording. But it was also a time when it would have been very difficult to have faked that. So my very first interview on this subject was with, with Scott Nelson, and he had just a remarkable body of material that, that he had analyzed. And Bigfoot, just the, the language was just so clear. You could, dis, you could distinguish the male voice, the female voice, the child's voice. And as they were speaking, it, it, you, could even, you could hear the emotional inflictions in the language. Now, he had to slow it down quite a bit to hear those because they talk at rapid speed. Yeah. They suspect they may have two sets or, or more than one set of lungs because, um, because of how much air that they, they move through. And they don't talk on the, where we talk you know, from an exhale, they talk from an inhale, which makes it sound very different. Very difficult to mimic um, the the sounds oh. that they make, but yeah, it's it was just a fascinating study. I did six hours of interview with him and came up with with you know two, uh, two, two um, one hour uh, videos that are on my YouTube channel uh, that discusses uh, the language of Bigfoot. They talk on the inhale. That is interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's very hard for humans to do that at all. Um, but yeah. it sounds very different. It sounds very different than than the human voice. That was another thing that that makes this sound very different and very difficult to um, to replicate. If someone were going to fake it or hoax this, it's very difficult to replicate that for a human to do mm. it. Wow. Are there anybody that you talked to that actually had had a communication with them, but they were trying to tell them something probably maybe telepathic or by words and uh have you run into that uh yeah several people i think what they call mind speak which is just a different way of saying telepathy um but usually they're not talking to to the sasquatch the sasquatch is relaying a message to them and they clearly understand this is coming from them. Sometimes it's a warning, you know, just to not go, come into the woods that day. I just don't come here. We don't want you around. Sometimes it's um, it, it's a different kind of message. Um, I know this this one um, that there was a distress and they were asking for help in a situation. And mm -hmm. so they telepathically or through mind speak told this person um, what their needs were. Uh, so that does happen. Um, but I don't know that I have heard of a conversation actually taking place, a long conversation or any kind of interaction of, of that sort for a long period of time. It's more just a quick kind of mind speak sort of interaction. Some people have habitual um, Sasquatch on their property. So they have families that live back in a wooded area and they have, they have a lot more interaction with them because it's yeah. constant. So they will have um, they will have some form of communication. Often, um, sometimes it's mind speak. Sometimes it's clear to them in their in the language that they hear. Sometimes it is um, just by some kind of symbol. You know, they'll leave rocks somewhere. They'll put a, a, a tree across a path. And it's like don't come in here at this time uh, for whatever reason. So yeah, there, there's there's quite a bit of communication that happens. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's telepathic, and sometimes it's not. What do you think the relations between the Sasquatch that we have here in the Northwest, Midwest, and wherever in the United States to the Yeti and the dominant snowman, let's say in the Himalayas, they, they look somewhat different. It's just the color is different, at least for the snowman. Exactly. But, you know, we do have polar bears and we have, you know, our, our our other bears, grizzly bears, and black bears here in the United States. So there, there are variations of the bear 
there are variations of humans in the way that they look and have evolved generally yeah. due to climate and such lifestyle. So I think they're related. I do think they have some kind of a, probably a genetic connection with one another. They've just evolved in, in different ways to accommodate the, the surroundings that they have. Even here in the United States, we have in the Southern swamps of Florida where it's very warm, uh, they're much smaller. They, they don't have the, the stature that they have like up in the, the Northwest uh, where they're very large and but in the northwest there there are mountains and snow and and they climb a lot and they do a lot of heavy lifting and so they're they're large and also their the body of food source that they may have is probably different as well um but the skunk ape as they are called in florida uh, are slender not as tall nowhere near the stature nowhere near the muscle bulk that they have in the northwest so here we have a, a, a large variety as well but largely i think that's due to, to climate yeah yeah and they probably don't call them skunk ape for nothing they probably smell <laughs> a little bit I would say so. Oh, uh, yeah, I think there's a there's often a smell with with Sasquatch, but not always, and don't know exactly why. I don't know if that's a warning yeah. or if it's just some that some of them just have more body odor. I don't know. Yeah, and at least the males they are extremely strong. I heard uh, stories where. They threw boulders. That is huge boulders. They threw them out of the side of the road, right in the middle of the road, to stop somebody. And humans couldn't do that. No, and they can take down a tree with just one tiny, you know, tiny whack. And yeah, um, yeah, they they just have an unbelievable strength. Mm -hmm. You know, they live in caves and uh, maybe underground, but there are some interdimensional ones too, because I remember reading a story about somebody that he had, um, he came up on a, uh, on a Sasquatch and his Sasquatch turned around and ran down this path and he took a few steps and disappeared. Right in front of him, he just was no longer there anymore. I've heard of that several times where, where someone's looking at one crossing the road and then it turns into kind of a, you know, like a heat sense or something like a heat wave. It's just a foggy something. You can't see them, but you can still see the, the grass moving and the bushes moving as they walk through it, but you can't see the Sasquatch anymore. It's like right. they can change form easily. And I don't know how they do that. I mean, I, we don't see any other creature doing that. Certainly, we don't seem to have that capacity. So I don't know exactly what they are. But if you look back in time and you look at legendary stories of, you know, of fairies and trolls and little people and and even ghosts, you know, that 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 can manifest into like a, a human body right in front of your face and look very real, very, very human. A few people I've interviewed even talk about them you know, having interaction with them, speaking to them. And um, there was this one case where a little boy was in the house and this old man came up to him and started talking to him and they had a whole conversation. And um, eventually his mother came into the room and asked him who he was talking to. And he described this man to her and she's, she knew this was her father uh, that had come in the room and talked with this little boy, but her father was deceased. So it was a ghost, but it looked just like a real person to him. So I think sometimes we also have to understand Bigfoot might fall into the category that we're seeing something that looks very real, very, very much, you know, a physical form, but maybe it's like a ghost. It can come and go from different worlds. Yeah, because there are realities next to ours and above us in vibration. Think of it this way. If you look at the light specter from there were, there is nothing, and all the way to the top. We can only see about 1% of it. What can we imagine lives in the other 99% of the light spectrum? There are people there, there are entities there, maybe Sasquatch, but there are spiritual entities there. 
So that makes sense. It does. And um, in my book, Threshold to Encounters, I talk about that. I talk about the our limited perception. If we only use our five senses, we're, we're going to miss a whole lot of stuff. Um, because in, in our five senses, we have limited perception and it's easy to get fooled. It's easy for us to, to not really know the truth of what we're looking at. Um, but if we if we look into these worlds from maybe a, a quantum level, there are so many realms that they could be coming from. And we don't know for sure if they're slipping over into our reality or if maybe somehow we are able to enter theirs. Uh, but either way, we're able to perceive them for short periods of time. And we don't know for sure if they're solid here the way, you know, like our, our cats and dogs are solid in our world. They're physical in our world, but we don't have Bigfoot in sight or within our realm long enough to even even study it um, from the perspective of am I seeing this as a physical thing or am I seeing this somehow as a spiritual entity like I would see a ghost? Yeah. They've done experiments on cats, and they know that they can see higher up into the light spectrum, into the infrared spectrum, where a lot of things going on. Especially if you have, oh, this is good. Get your hands on a fourth generation night vision goggles. Take them with you out in the woods at night. You're going to see animals. Take the goggles off, and they're not there anymore. That's right. Yes. And that's, yeah. that's true that when people when people research Sasquatch and they go out and do campouts, um, you know, they see so much on the infrared cameras. They see a lot with their night vision cameras. But without those, I'm not sure that world would even really be solid for us. I mean, it's, we can't see it. We just can't see it. Yeah, the nuts and the bolts people, they're really missing it. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah, you know, when you think that if you can't see it, touch it, smell it, eat it, and throw it in the air and shoot holes in it, you know, it doesn't exist. They are missing the 99%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a much there. big world out there. Yeah, and uh, there are, I grew up in Norway, and back there, there was a, at least in years past, they used to talk a lot about the trolls that lived under bridges and in the woods and stuff. Well, that's not just stories. There are people that swear up and down that, yes, I saw one. And there, some of them are that they talk about, they're about three to four foot tall. They are dressed in the regular clothing, which they have a way to make. And these were, they call them trolls and they have hats on. And yeah, we joke about it, but it's actually the way they saw them. Exactly. And, uh, and, and I too have talked with a lot of people and um, that see little people. I know this, there's a, there's some kind of a stick man out there. That's not very tall. Um, Native Americans in our country talk about that a lot. Um, that this little, this little character, there's, there are also um, just beings of all sizes. They live in nature mostly. And I think that oftentimes I think that these are like living beings that nature produces. Um, and the orbs that so many people see also, I think, come from like a, a natural consciousness um, that's within nature. And those can manifest for us to see them anyway, in a form that looks like a little bean or a creature of some sort that we're not familiar with. I think we've moved away from that when we when we started moving away from nature and not a lot of us go walking you know, through um, through the brooks and the woods anymore. So. Um, we're not the ones, maybe if, if we are limited on those experiences, we might not see that sort of thing. But a lot of people do. A lot of people who camp out, they're the ones that also will see Sasquatch. They're the ones that will see the orbs and the, the unusual, interesting beings that, that may be all around us. Yeah, the, the human form is probably the most prevalent form throughout the universe. 
And uh, here we have many different types of it. Nobody talks about the pygmies. <laughs> True. <They're> definitely, <laughs> I mean, about four foot tall. That's, that's as tall as they get. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, they're as perfect humans. And then we have the really small one. There are pictures of some of them. And do you happen to read that report that came, it was published in uh, archaeology uh, journals? That was uh, probably about seven or eight years ago now. There was somebody in Antarctica that they opened up. They saw a rock that was laying there, was cracked. So they opened it up. And inside, there was a fossilite, perfect human skeleton. Only that it was, if they stretched it out, it would be 11 inches long. Oh my, no, I don't think I saw that. Yeah, it was written up in archaeology journals and suddenly everything went quiet. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about it anymore. I got a picture of it on broadcastteamalpha.com. Uh, in fact, I got a NASA print too that show a little guy about probably a foot, foot and a half tall on Mars. Standing, leaning up against a rock. There is no question that's a person. Because there's some people that get a hold of the transmission before Nantha get a hold of it and they decipher it for themselves. There's another picture too. There's a gray standing about 20 foot away from the rover, clear as a bell. So we have humans and humanoids everywhere. And then there are humanoids that is non-physical. You dealt with ghosts quite a bit. <laughs> I have, yes, yes, I have. Um, I have done a lot of research in the ghost field. I even, I even owned a haunted house at one time. I didn't live there, but I owned it for a while, and it was, it was interesting. A lot of very strange things happened in the house. Um, there was a, a woman, unfortunately, that had committed suicide in the attic, and they felt like this ghost had materialized from that experience, and that's unfortunate. But it's centralized in one room of the house downstairs, and it was an area where the, the family lived there, um, had their children's toys. It was kind of a playroom for the kids. And the children's toys, they, they had a, a, a fire truck that had a ladder on the fire truck. And the ladder would just go berserk. It would just go up and down and up and down and up and down. It would just all by itself. Um, strange noises throughout the house. The electrical appliances would come on and off a lot. Um, it was just, it was a kind of um, thing that they had learned to live with. But the whole neighborhood knew the house was haunted. And one year it even ended up on television because it was such a haunted house. Um, the, the, the news came out and, and did an interview with the people and got the whole haunted house story for Halloween that year. Um, so I've had a little bit of an experience with a uh, haunted house. I've only had one ghost encounter that was my own, my personal encounter with a ghost. And it was, um, it was one where I just could feel it, but I could feel something behind me. I was in my house and a woman who could see energies was sitting across from me. She looked she could see something behind me, but I was feeling it. And so I got up and moved and said, I just felt a little uncomfortable. She commented that she could see some energy movement back there in the corner of that room. But within just a couple of days, there was a man that I was doing hypnosis in my home at that time. And a man came to me for a hypnotic session in my house. He came in and he was acting a little strange. He wasn't saying much. I was trying to direct him into that very living room. Uh, where I felt the ghost, because that's where I usually started the interview process and kind of got to know one another and uh, you kind of understood what they wanted to accomplish that day. But he wasn't going there. He, he walked around my house. He crossed his arms. He came back to the living room. And finally, he said, I think my father used to own this house. Um, and, and it was kind of strange, you know, that he didn't know this before. But um, but he, he said, I think my father owned this house. And he pointed to that very corner where I had felt that energy, kind of uncomfortable energy behind me. And he said, and he died right there. 
So that was kind of confirming that, uh, that I was feeling it. My friend was seeing it. And then he confirmed that someone had died right there in that very corner where I was feeling that energy. So those are kind of my personal stories with, with ghosts, but a lot of other people, um, that I've done research with and, um, went to a small, um, Victorian town. That's kind of a touristy town with a lot of old hotels and, um, did a, a complete, um, search of the town for ghosts. We did several episodes on the TV show. I had anomalies about the ghost in that town. One was very, very haunted. This house had some unusual anomalies about it. Um, there was a couple lived there and um, they had noticed some strange things happening, but they kind of were ignoring it. They came home one day from a party. It was late. They probably had a drink or two, but the lady didn't want her dress to get messed up. So she she took the dress off and just laid it over the sofa in the living room uh, to keep it in good shape while she and then she got ready for bed and went to bed. The next morning she wakes up. The dress is not on the sofa anymore, not draped over the sofa where she left it the night before. And she's looking everywhere for it. She finally opens the freezer on her refrigerator and there is the dress the wonderful dress that she was trying to keep in such smooth wonderful condition is all wadded up stuffed in the freezer um how it got there she has no idea but there she is but they had this really interesting statue in their living room it was an old antique statue oh worldly it, it didn't look like it came from the u.s it looked like something that was european or something like that um, it was about three feet tall, I would say, fairly, fairly good size. Um, it was a kind of a bust or a statue, but it was very large. And she said a lot of the um, of the activity seemed to be coming from that statue or near that statue, the unusual things that were happening within this home. Um, they would have, you know, change just fall out of the ceiling. I mean, it would just fall from the air. <laughs> you know, that's unusual. Now, that is a very odd thing to happen. Um, they would have, you know, they could see things in the windows when they would go outside, you know, images like that look like people. Um, and, and the attic area of the home or the upstairs portion of the house, they had a lot of sound, a lot of voices coming from up there as well. There were just a lot of very unusual things. So we measured that. Um, and there, there was a lot of electrical energy in the home that was not accounted for. So, so there was some, some kind of an energy field that, that was definitely present in the house. Now, they weren't the first ones to, to notice this. There were other people that had lived in this home um, years past. It was an old home. And uh, a lot of people were aware that there were a lot of, of very unusual things happening within, within that house. There were other houses in that uh, small town that also were haunted, several hotels that were haunted. Um, and we, we did a, just a thorough research of that, of that city. And that was just a great fun, great fun mm -hmm. show and a lot of good information. Yeah. 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 And for you that joined us late into this show, we are talking with Linda Eastburn and uh, so we were talking about some of the goofy stuff that, uh, is out there that cannot be explained by Newtonian physics. And she has a new book out called Threshold to Encounters. And that deals with encounters of Sasquatch and ghosts and uh, other entities. And she's also the, um, the host of the Linda Eastburn channel on YouTube. So go there and watch some of them. I did. And um, when I got on to one, I just couldn't quit on that. I, I had to watch the whole thing because it was so interesting. And uh, now I want your opinion on something else. I have several people living in this house. Two other ones are physical, but there are some other ones. And I call them shadow people because I can see them right out the corner of my eye. They they're tall shadows standing there. When I turn my head and look, they're gone. And they're, they're all over. It happens every day I can see this. What are those things? Wow. You know, I don't know, but I've seen them as well. Um, and I, I used to, when, when something really phenomenal was about to happen, I wouldn't have a conscious awareness of it, but what would happen is I would see those little shadow things running along the wall in the floor of the house, you know, just mm -hmm. like it's a little, you know, just a little movement and you look and there's nothing there. There's absolutely nothing around, 
Um, but I used to do a lot of hypnosis with people who had um, what they felt like were abduction experiences with uh, with UFOs and aliens. And I remember one day um, a woman was coming that that afternoon to have a hypnotic session. I lived, was in the, my kitchen and I kept seeing what you were talking about as that dark, tall shadow. I kept seeing that in the, out of the corner of my eye. But when I would look into the living room where I was seeing it, it wasn't there. There was nothing there. I even thought maybe my husband was in the, in the house and was why he would be standing in the corner of the living room. I have no idea, but you know, you just try to find some kind of reasoning around what you're, what you think you're seeing. But I kept seeing this all dark shadow person back there. Well, she got there that afternoon and we, um, we were talking about what we were going to try to accomplish that afternoon with the hypnosis session. And she began by discussing as a child, she would wake up and see this dark, tall, what seemed like male figure to her in the corner of her house. And I thought, oh, that's probably why I'm seeing this, because I would imagine, since we're going to be dealing with that kind of subject, um, that I was just given an introduction to, to the being, or the being just showed up to, to watch or observe that day, possibly. Um, once, once she left, uh, once that session was over, I never saw it again. So I think it left with her. Uh, but that was kind of, it was a little bit of a shock because I hadn't seen that before. It was, that was, that was interesting. I'm not sure what they are, but I definitely think they're of a different realm. And I think they interact with us if we're willing to, you know, to, to let them be present. I did not feel intimidated by this one. I didn't feel like there was any danger to me or any kind of a possessive quality to it or anything like that. It wasn't going to harm harm me in any way. But I do think this was a deep fear of hers because since childhood, she'd seen that. And that's some of what we were dealing with was her, her fear of being abducted, but also her fears of all the things that she was able to see. I think this is also, and, and I'm sure you've run into this too, um, the, the sadness about not understanding some of what we're going through as children will often see things. And yeah. sometimes it can be very frightening to them. And they don't have an explanation. And oftentimes the parents will just tell them it's nothing, it's their imagination, uh, just move past it, whatever. And um, they can't because they continue to see it and they don't understand what it is that they're dealing with. So it can be a little frightening for a child. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we kind of destroy their perception, the extrasensory perception that way. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, they should just go with it. Have them explain what they see. Try to get them to interact with it, if it is friendly at least. So we can get an understanding of what they really see. And that is, uh, we talked about cats before. I have two and a half cat living here in the house. <laughs> the half cat is because she thinks she live here. So, you know, she comes around. <laughs> and there are times when I especially see one of them. She start looking around the room and she look at something on the wall. And she sit there and stares at it. There's something there that she, sh she sees. And I wonder what. Well, that's the thing. I think intuitively we might be able to, to go into an altered state and be able to perceive what, what might be there. But with mm -hmm. our eyes, no, we, we just don't have the ability to do that. Yeah. But that is so common with cats. Cats seem to have just a, a strong, strong sense yeah. of, entities and beings in a room or energy any way that's that's around that's very common when it comes to ghosts i know there are different levels of existence all the way up the ladder to some people say the 12th dimension and i don't know i'm, I'm an astral traveler but i haven't been up there so <laughs> i uh i wonder where are most of the ghosts trapped and uh is it slightly above us in, let's say, the astral world uh, vibration? So it, could it be parallel to us, too, in our existence? So that because there was one person that came back from a near-death experience and he said, I was just in, in another room, being as physical as I am here. So, Yes. Could it be well, both? I 
I think they, I think they're just present with us all the time. I don't even know if there's much of a change. It's just a different frequency. So we don't mm -hmm. perceive it readily. Um, but I think, you know, as it just changes frequency, of course, they're out of the body, you know, once, once they're deceased, they're out of that body, which is what we interact with mostly when we're conscious and awake, um, as sleep in sleep or in an altered state of consciousness, we should be able to have a lot more perception of these things. Um, yeah. but I don't, I don't think it's so far away. I don't, I don't know. Distance is really what we, how we would say, say that, but just a different frequency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because outside of the physical, time and space does not exist as we know it. So right. that makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as an astro traveler, I have ran into entities outside of the physical. And I think every one of them that I've ever run into have no spiritual knowledge. Mm -hmm. So they're confused. They're really confused. They want to know they're, they're, they're all over. You're trying to figure out I can see you, but what are you? Why am I here? And they all, they don't know what to do. They don't know to go to the light or go to higher spiritual realms where things are nice. The astral world is not really all that nice of a place. Yeah, they can get stuck um, yeah. with, without some kind of assistance or, or help in, in moving through that. I know, yeah. I think well, sometimes you can... I think I think the ghosts that are perceived sometimes are in that state. They just don't know how to move along. Yeah, that's the thing. And uh, I think people should practice and uh, learn astro travel. It's not that hard to do, mm -hmm. and you can actually help disembodied entities to go home because where they are is not their home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think you can do some of. Uh, can you do anything like this with hypnosis? Yeah, hypnosis is a, a wonderful tool um, to use to get into all these varied states of mind. Um, and I mostly used it to help people to get into deeper states for meditation. But also I taught intuitive skills or psychic skills for a long time as well, remote viewing skills. So it helped people to, uh, to go into those deeper states to get more access to that information. So yes, I think it's a, it's an excellent tool. I certainly used it myself uh, when I was learning um, how to go deeper into a meditation. Not so much for astral projection, even though I've done some of that, uh, but mostly um, I use it in in teaching other people how to do um, these intuitive skills. When you investigate ghosts or disembodied entities, are you also using electronic equipment of any kind? I personally am not, but the partner I had at that time, Ted Phillips, um, had a, a, a good amount of equipment that he used to perceive when something in the area was, I guess would say uh, abnormal, the electromagnetic field was was not uh, not as, as normal. Um, also, we used um, some of the, the tools to be able to, to record to see if there was any sound, any voices, anything of that nature. We did not receive much feedback. I, th I think when we were doing that more readily, um, there, it, we didn't have as sophisticated equipment as they have today. That's for sure. Um, so I think the equipment today picks up a lot of things. I've interviewed a lot of people um, who have, have had, you know, just really good feedback, um, vocal feedback uh, from, from the other side. Um, we didn't get a lot of that, but we got a lot of electromagnetic field activity. You know that 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 was very present, both with the ghost research, the UFO research, and I hear even people with with the Bigfoot research that they're finding that the areas where Bigfoot resides, oftentimes they can pick up on a very strong electromagnetic field in the area. Batteries go dead um, in yeah. both UFO research as well as Bigfoot research. Batteries go dead. Electrical chronic equipment, malfunctions often. You know, these things say that there's there's definitely this physical element here that something is not exactly normal. Um, so we, we did measure that, yes. Yeah, I also seem like they're able to suck energy out of the physical because there are times when there is a disembodied entity there, the room turns cold. Yes. 
That's true. Yeah, there's often a, a temperature change. Lighting can sometimes change. I've seen a lot of light bulbs just suddenly pop out um, you know, that they're just not working anymore. Um, you know, there's just, it's almost like there's a surge of energy suddenly uh, that can take over a room or take over a space. And when that energy comes in, it it alters, you know, our normal physical world. And so things respond. And it seems like the electrical things respond more than other things, but certainly our physical bodies, we are able to feel that as cold or whatever in the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, have you heard about the Tesla spirit radio? I have not heard of that. Tell me about it. Oh, in, in 1901, Nikola Tesla, he uh, patented a radio and if you Google the Tesla Spirit Radio and then go to YouTube and do the same thing, you can see them operating that radio. And it is phenomenal what they can hear through it. You hook it up to a speaker or the computer. And it's, uh, I think I said, it's about 14, 15 different parts to it. It's really simple. Wow, well, I, I'll have to do that. That sounds like fun. Oh, I tell you, you go and listen to it on YouTube, um, the Tesla Spirit Radio. There is some static in the background on usually, but if you run it through a computer, then you can weed out the static and you can hear the voices very clearly. Now, you can also hear them. They ask for their name, and the ghost will tell you his name. And that's just you and that little radio the radio that is not plugged in the wall. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, yeah. So, this is, uh, it is working. About 100% of the time when people sit down and do this, they get something because we are never alone. There's always somebody around. Yes, that's true. I remember an experiment we did back in the 90s, probably not far from that time. It was just a simple recorder. Uh, but we would just leave it running and you know, just to see what we could pick up, you know, and just just let it run. Um, and sometimes you would get something that just sounded like a human voice. I mean, it was it was very clear, um, didn't usually say anything that was profound, but still, you know, we were able to able to um, to hear something. And it was, that was an interesting project. But that was in the 90s. Um, mm -hmm. And we just didn't have our, our equipment was not as sophisticated as it is today. Yeah, yeah. I remember back in Omaha, before I moved to Tucson, me and a friend, we went to, actually two friends, we went to a graveyard. We had a tape recorder. And uh, I constructed a, a funnel that we construct, uh, put right over the microphone. And we walked around with this thing and uh, we played, well, I think we have walked around for 10, 15 minutes and we stopped it and we played it back. And yeah, the voice was right on there. Mm -hmm. And he said, get out. Mm -hmm. It was clear that voice. And it said some other things. I'm not sure what it was. And I remember one of my friends, that's all he heard. He was gone. He <laughs> split. He yeah. split just like that. It could be a little frightening. And I heard some some researchers, some ghost researchers that were in this haunted house and spent the night and they had recorders like that. And they had some some message on there that was very clear, of, you know, that they didn't want them there. And they all heard it. They played it back and they all heard it. But it didn't last. It was only on there for about a half an hour. And then mm -hmm. after that, it just disappeared. So there's something about their ability maybe to project and be on this electronic equipment, but sometimes I'm not sure if they, if it has the ability to stay because it, it's probably not the same as my voice say that a recorder would pick up on. It's a, a little different somehow. So have you heard of that where, where these can just disappear suddenly? I think I heard something about that because there was, a, I, read, I read in European newspapers all the time. And uh, there was an article about a lady in Sweden. Her husband had died. And she came home and, you know, from, from I think from the funeral, she came home 
and she ran. That was back when we had answering machines. Mm -hmm. Remember those? Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so she ran the messages back, and there was a message from her husband. Mm -hmm. Right wow. on the answering machine, and there was nothing there before. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Everything is good here. Don't worry." We'll be together soon, or I'm paraphrasing here, but that's basically what he said. My goodness. And that lasted for a few days, and then she couldn't find it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, definitely have heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing about it again is that once you go down this path looking for things that other people don't look for, it gets so interesting, your life will never be the same. It's true. It, it becomes a part of your, of your life. And one of the motivations I had for writing the book, Threshold to Encounters, is because, you know, I, I spent almost 40 years researching this subject from UFOs to ghosts to paranormal to psychic abilities, you know, all of the uh, the things that, including Sasquatch now, you know, in the last year and a half, two years, so all of that kind of came together in the book to, to help people understand the vastness of, of the subject matter. Right. Um, they all have some kind of an interconnectedness. Um, I try to bring out those points in the book, but also um, the, the things that we may not have totally thought about. Um, there was, I know I, I, back in, in the days when I was doing hypnosis, more I was teaching hypnosis and there was a man showed up at my home um, to take the class. And he did take the class and he went through, it was a 12 week course and he'd gone through maybe four, four lessons. We met once a week and he came this one day for a practice session. And he started telling me, even though he reluctantly told me that he had been part of this, this secret organization. And it was back East, um, in new England. And he had married into this family that had really deep pockets money and they took him into this organization and took him up the ranks really fast to the top. And there, I guess they did more occult type of things, but they had programmed him to receive information as they would send it out and see how he could respond to it. Well, he was still receiving that, but he was seeing UFOs in the sky and aliens in his house. And he was getting premonitions about the future. He was seeing headlines everywhere. And he felt like that this was kind of a bizarre kind of form of mind control. And um, and that made me think about that, you know, that, that some people may not be able to decipher, you know, you and I, if we go into those inner levels, we know where we're headed. We know what we're looking for. We yeah. have some sense of discernment. Um, but he had kind of been thrust into this in kind of a bizarre way. And he felt like he didn't have control over his, his own life. So I go into some things like that that people may not think about mm -hmm. and ways to protect themselves, uh, things to look for, um, to understand that things can be generated these days. And we have holograms these days you can't tell from real life. So virtual reality is sort of headed our direction. So I'm working on a class now to help people to have that kind of discernment where you know exactly what you're you're dealing with. And I'm sure you would agree that if you can identify frequency, um, if you can feel that frequency, you have a much better understanding yeah. of what you're dealing with. You know, is this an electronic projection? Is this a hologram that's being administered that I don't understand? Is this a, a spirit from the other world or am I discerning something that's actually of a physical realm? Um, but if you can identify those, it's 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 like understanding the difference between daylight and dark. You know, you understand the frequency of those different time frames. We also understand the difference of frequencies. So the book goes into that that as well. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there are people that is listening to this show, and they are starting to think like, hmm, maybe I should look into this. Yeah. If somebody that is just starting off from scratch, what do you think they should start with? Maybe besides learning meditation. That's kind of a must. <laughs> that was, that's, that's the number one thing. You know, learning meditation in a comfortable way to, to, to gently learn how to go into those inner levels. I think as you go in deeper, it's good to have some kind of a structure so you have some kind of an agenda because, you know, it, as you know, if you go into those inner levels, it's a big world in there. 
<laughs> so you don't yeah. want to just go in and get lost. You want to to have some some kind of a goal, some kind of an intent. Um, always you know surround yourself with with protective energies, of course. And I think your intentions will do that by large by and large. So I think that's that's a good starting point. Learning hypnosis is a lot like meditation, only it will take you maybe even a little deeper. Yep. Um, doing hypnosis was one of the ways that I, I learned how to be more intuitive, along with learning focus, really good focus when I'm in there so I can direct my attention. I remember the beginning point where I was doing meditation, asking a question, listening for an answer. I remember when that sort of started coming back and I could hear an answer to my question. I would verify those to know that I wasn't just out in left field making that up. Um, but also at a point, I began to realize when I was in those deeper states, I could ask another question and a dialogue would open. And it was a back and forth kind of situation then. So that was a, a real advancement. So I think having those kinds of stepping stones as you progress into this is really wise. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it gets so interesting. When it, if I'm at a party, I am a total bore. I, 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 I can't talk about football and the <laughs> weather. And I'd rather get into quantum mechanics and law of attraction and things like that. And, you know, a lot of people, have, their eyes roll back in the head and they stumble away from you. It's just want nothing to do with you anymore. Right. That's okay with me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I surround myself with friends that have some interest in this too. It's it's always good yeah. to have people that have their experiences and you learn from other people and have that that body of of individuals that uh, that you can interact with on this subject matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh gosh, we're getting down towards the end here. Um, let people know where they can get a hold of you, get in touch with you, because you're doing hypnosis. And there are, I've been a hypnotist for 50 years or more, so I know what that can do. There's phenomenal solutions in there. I don't care what it is. You have a sore toe or you want to lose 50 pounds, or if you want to go back and find out your, what did I do in my previous lives? It's mm -hmm. all there available. Speak to that just a little bit, what you can help them with. Oh, goodness. You know, hypnosis can do uh, miraculous things. You know, memory regression is, is certainly one of those things. But, you know, one of the ways that I use hypnosis is also seeing into the future. Uh, time is not stagnant. I mean, you can use hypnosis to travel all over the place. So so I take people on future journeys and past journeys and, and you know, and, and resolving issues that are just, you know, physical things. They want to pass a test that's in college they're having a hard time with, getting their concentration up more. I mean, all of those suggestions are are wonderful you know, things that that they can can do. They can get in touch with me through my email address, which is just Linda Eastburn at gmail.com. Um, so they can also find me on my, on my Linda Eastburn YouTube channel. Um, and also I have um, a group, I have two groups on big, on Facebook that they can join and, and interact with me personally. Uh, but one is called Bigfoot Cryptid Midwest. And the other one is UFO Alien Ghost for Real. Um, so those two groups um, exist and you can go join those and also get in touch with me through that. Wow, that sounds wonderful. And also let them know where they can find your books. Absolutely. Um, Threshold to Encounter is my latest book. It's on Amazon. If you want the other two, which the first one is called Riding the Intuitive Wave. And the other one is With Heart, how consciousness, um, how the how the heart interacts with consciousness on a universal level. So that one's a pretty in-depth book. The first one is just kind of how I started my journey. It has a few little instructions at the end. It's just a beginning kind of book. The last one is probably the most interesting just because it delves into all the bizarre encounters that people have and and we all have them um but a lot of people don't like to talk about them because they're so unusual and mainstream america doesn't always believe you but uh but they do happen they're for real yeah yeah there you go oh i have a personal question for you yes i like to ask that question if you could speak to the whole world and the world is listening, what would you tell them? You are so much more than what you probably realize. Yeah. 
that should send them down the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, Lena. This has been fun. Yes. Thank this you for having me on. It was a, a joy. Yeah, this was great. And uh, you mentioned some things during the uh, interview here that we didn't really get to talk about. So maybe I could talk you into coming back sometime. I'd love to. Absolutely. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you very much. And... Uh, uh, go see Linda on YouTube or uh, contact her on the webs or the uh, the email and uh, get in touch. Okay, thank so, you. So, so until then, be good to each other. <laughs>